नमस्कार फ्रेंड्स एंड वेलकम टू अ न्यू सीरीज कॉल्ड इकोनॉमिक सूत्र एंड आई एम गोइंग टू बी द सूत्रधार हु विल बी टेकिंग यू थ्रू द होल रेंज ऑफ इकोनॉमिक पॉलिसीज रेंजिंग फ्रॉम अर्बन पॉलिसी एंड द स्मार्ट सिटीज प्रोजेक्ट टू इंसॉल्वेंसी एंड बैंक मैक्रो इकोनॉमिक स्टेबिलिटी एक्सपोर्ट एंड द पी एल आई स्कीम द मोनिटाइजेशन एंड प्राइवेटाइजेशन प्रोग्राम एंड टू गिव यू अ सेंस ऑफ द इंटेलेक्चुअल फ्रेमवर्क दैट अंडरमिन मेनी ऑफ दीज पॉलिसीज एज वेल एज द थिंकिंग दैट गोज इन टू दक्चरिंग दीज पॉलिसीज एट द ग्राउंड लेवल द आइडिया इज दैट व्यूअर्स गेट अ सेंस एज गुड सिटीजन्स ऑफ वॉट इज इट दैट द गवर्नमेंट इज ट्राइंग टू डू of course it is up to you to judge then whether these policies are successful or not but at least you will be able to understand where these policies come from what are they trying to achieve and how they have been structured and how step by step we are moving forward with them now an important part of understanding these policies is to understand the economic intellectual framework and philosophy behind it now this is important because like any other field economics is an evolving arena new ideas come old ideas die out new experiments are tried some succeed some fail and so over a period of time the field of economics has changed unfortunately much of the economics you will have read about especially if you are economics graduates will be from textbooks that are based on economic ideas of the 19th and 20th centuries but economics has moved on from that and i'm going to try and do the following thing in this particular episode which is to give you a sense of the intellectual framework that is behind many of the policies that you are seeing implemented today because very often you may find that they are in variance with what you may have read or learned uh, in your textbooks now much of textbook economics that is taught in colleges and universities around the world not just in india is based on ideas that have evolved in the late 19th and early 20th centuries now at that time as you may be aware the intellectual framework of that time the tech, the dominant technology of that time was the steam engine and of course this is derived from newtonian mechanics and physics so not surprisingly many of the terms that you learn in conventional economics comes from newtonian physics um terms like equilibrium or um the levers of monetary and fiscal policy or uh, the term liquidity which is obviously a hydraulic term now it doesn't mean that uh viewing the world through this particular lens doesn't provide new insights far from it they are useful uh models and conceptions however it does lead you to begin to think of the economy as some sort of a gigantic steam engine and a steam engine that is running along um a fixed path uh, uh rails which we may call it at the trend line so then the impression you get is that economic policy is about the following thing which is that if the steam engine is running too fast then you pull the brakes or if it's running too slow you shovel in some coal into the engine in the form of monetary or fiscal uh, stimulus so this ends up having a peculiar uh, unidimensional view of uh, economic policy on the other hand um what if we live in a world that is full of churn of uncertainty that it is a complex chaotic system where we are being given these shocks which may be uh, geopolitical shocks there may be natural disasters there may be technological changes um it could be changes in consumer behavior and supply chains now this is really the world we actually live in where there is no real equilibrium and yet the idea of equilibrium is so central to all of the usual mainstream discourse uh, on economics oddly enough nobody has actually seen an equilibrium in fact if anything it is a superstition um an idea that there is some optimal point that 
economics leads to or economists should strive for. But as you have just seen, the world economy has never been in equilibrium. After all, if you, if you went back to the beginning of the year 2020, who would have known that the world economy would be thrown into complete chaos by a pandemic? It was always a possibility, but I don't know anybody who had truly forecast that the year 2020 this was going to happen. Now somebody may say, uh, well, you know, uh, you know, shock like the COVID pandemic happens once in a hundred years, uh, we should just ignore it. Maybe a pandemic in itself may be rare, but shocks are quite common. So if you went back a decade, then were we in equilibrium? Far from it, we had been hit very recently by the global financial crisis and we were just about emerging from it. If you went back a decade from that, we had the dot-com bubble and we were just emerging from the Asian financial crisis. Go back a decade back from that, we had the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. In fact, we here at India faced a major crisis that forced us to begin to open up our economy. The point that I'm making here is that no economy, and certainly not the world economy or India's economy, have ever been really in any equilibrium. So why is it that we are all fussed about this? And yet, all of economics is all about finding this optimal equilibrium. In fact, the real difference between those who believe in socialist policies and those who are enamored by a sort of laissez-faire, uh, markets-based system is that one group believes that, you know, a group of socialist bureaucrats sitting in the planning commission know exactly where this equilibrium is and the way to reach it. Whereas those who believe in laissez-faire market economics may take the view that if you let everything free, then the invisible hand of the market will somehow miraculously take you to this optimal equilibrium. Now notice, both of them believe in this optimal equilibrium. And the, the idea that economists know where this optimal equilibrium is, is laughable. In fact, one of the greatest economists uh, ever, Frederick Hayek, called this the pretense of knowledge, that economists uh, try to uh, project that they know precisely where the equilibrium is in, uh, into the future and how uh, they can devise uh, very, very prescriptive, deterministic policies to reach that um, equilibrium. Fortunately, um, the field of economics has begun to evolve and begun to take into account this whole issue of uncertainty, of randomness, of complexity. And many new thinkers are beginning to uh, come up with ideas trying to deal with this. Um, of course, as I mentioned, uh, there were the Austrian School of Economists like uh, Frederick Hayek, but more recently there have been economists like um, uh, Nassim Taleb Dole. Uh, perhaps he would not like to be called an economist and would prefer to call himself a mathematician or philosopher. Um, but the ideas that are now beginning to percolate through the field uh, take a very different take on how policy making should be made for this uncertain world. And here in India, we have been implementing many of these policies using this new framework. And you may have seen that happening with our response, response to COVID. Many well-known experts, even Nobel laureates around the world, uh, during the COVID period, uh, took the view that India's response should have been one of having one grand um, reinflation package uh, that kind of spent a lot of money trying to reinflate the economy right up front uh, back as early as April and May of 2020. But as you will remember, we did not do that. Instead, we have taken the approach of doing a series of small and medium packages. Why? Because we took the view that this was not a sprint, but a marathon and a marathon through a great deal of uncertain terrain. So rather than use up all our uh, ammunition right up front, we have actually taken a much more calibrated approach where have, we have taken continuous feedback and responded. This approach may appear initially to lack some sort of a grand plan, 
It is true. But when you're dealing with uncertainty, you can't have these grand plans. What you can have is a broad mission, a broad vision. Um, and then you move forward through a feedback loop based approach. Now, it, it is reactive, yes, but what it does allow you to do is to feel your way across the river by feeling the stones. Incidentally, China itself used this approach to build itself up to becoming the world's second largest economy in just three decades. So this is a strategy that has been used repeatedly. Other countries have done so too in their phases of high growth. There is no reason why we should not use this strategy as well. One of the things that we will attempt to do in this uh, series is to show you how different economic policies have been informed by this new economic philosophy. We will illustrate uh, specific um, projects or policies and of course show you some of the outcomes wherever they are available. That will allow you to judge both what we are attempting to do, the kinds of policies that we have put in place and of course uh, as citizens um, be informed about uh, the outcomes. Now, <clears throat> the first one that I'm going to talk about uh, in this series is going to be about smart cities. Now, many people may be under the impression that this has got something to do with smartphones or digital technologies. Well, in some cases they may be, but the smartness of this uh, project comes from a totally different uh, idea. So let me explain. You see, this is not the first time that the central government has thought about um, interventions in the urban space. I mean, clearly, Indian cities need urban interventions. However, much of the uh, management and planning of cities obviously is done at the state or even municipal level. Yet, going back all the way to the experiment with Chandigarh uh, in the 1950s, we have been trying to create economic and uh, design models for um, our cities. However, as is quite obvious, this approach has not quite worked. Uh, and we have kept attempting to do newer and newer ones. But something that has been quite common to all the attempts till now is that they have all been very top down. There has been this uh, central idea that there is an ideal city and that if only we manage to uh, crack this one model which is the ideal model then it's only a matter of replicating it all over the country and this is essentially the idea behind Chandigarh and then of course we then attempted to replicate it in various parts of the country most of these attempts have not been successful the most recent attempt at doing this was the JNURM Again, it was somewhat more targeted to certain kinds of services like uh, providing uh, drainage or urban transport and so on. But even there, the fundamental idea was that a bureaucrat sitting in a central location, say that the planning commission, knew what all the other cities wanted and then it was only a matter of going out there and implementing them on the ground. The smart cities approach takes a very different uh, uh, philosophy uh, and tries to implement it. Again, informed by the new, new idea that central planners cannot possibly know what is needed on the ground. So if that is the case, then how can you do these interventions? So the smartness of the smart city project is derived mostly from the idea that the people and citizens and and, and urban managers in the specific city know what they want. At the very least, the interventions have to be done in context of the requirements of that city. So for the very first time, through the, the Smart City project, what we did is we asked citizens, we asked the local municipal managers, what is it that you want? And it turns out that they want different things. So the smart city project is quite interesting in that it allows for highly differentiated interventions in different cities according to what is the local requirement. So for example, um, in the city of Indore, the smart city project funded a street food uh, project called Chappan, 
which has converted a stretch of a what used to be a very um, busy uh, thoroughfare and pedestrianized it and it's now become a public space. In another uh, location you will find that it is a, a water harvesting project. In yet another place it may be a, a park that has been created on derelict piece of land. Um, in some cases there may be digital uh, interventions as well, for example traffic management uh, systems and a, 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 a control room and so on and so forth and you will see uh, in our episode on smart cities how that has uh, worked out. There can be a similar illustration of this approach in another area, for example with the Pradhan Mentri Avas Yojana. Now housing is obviously a major issue in India. Uh, this is true both uh, in cities where there's rapid urbanization happening but also in rural areas where because of uh, you know uh, poverty and repeatedly having natural disasters like floods you find the housing stock is simply of very poor quality. Now obviously we all want uh, that the citizens of this country have uh, proper pakka houses and modern houses and amenities. For this there have been in many many interventions over the years. However, one of the problems again was top-down thinking. So the earlier interventions, for example the one in Delhi uh, with <coughs> DDA would be to create a urban project um, where the planner would decide that this is where a certain section, say the poor, need to live and this is the kind of housing that they should live in. Now in the pre-1991 era of scarcity, uh, people were willing to simply take whatever they were given. But as more and more choices have become available in the post-liberalization era, it has been found that uh, even the poor do not want to move into some of these uh, uh, you know, master planned locations. Uh, in fact, uh, in many cases houses have been built at sometimes subsidized prices and yet people are unwilling to move into them. In many cases they have even given up their uh, uh, their, the houses that were allocated to, to them. So why is this happening? This is happening because what the planners want does not correlate to what the citizen wants in terms of the place they want to live or the kind, kinds of housing they want. So the new approach to the Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana ha has been to enable people to in situ upgrade themselves. So if a citizen has a piece of land or they want to themselves try to build a, 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 a location where uh, they have some access then the uh, Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana enables them to in situ upgrade themselves. Now notice that this is a very different decentralized approach to trying to solve the same problem and we have done this in cities and we have done this in rural areas and the outcomes are quite astounding. Yet another illustration of this new approach uh, is uh, the approach we have taken to encouraging exports through PLI schemes. Here of course by the very nature of it we have had to uh, pick winners in terms of sectors because obviously you cannot provide uh, the PLI type support to any and every sector. But again notice here we have not tried to pick winners through a license permit system. Far from it, what we have done is we have ge given a general uh, support to anybody who can scale up and create a large globally competitive cluster in the chosen sector. Now one of the foundational ideas and concepts behind many of our policies is Atmanirbhar Bharat, very often translated as self-reliant India. Now, what does Atmanirbhar Bharat have to do with the economic philosophy that I just talked about? And how is it different from the pre-1991 socialist policy of licenses and permits and import substitution? Now let me clarify that Atmanirbhar Bharat has nothing to do with the old 
pre-1991 import substitution, nor is it an attempt to return to the license permit era of uh, that uh, time. None of us have any intentions of driving around in ambassador cars ever again. So what is it really about? So the idea behind Atmanirbhar Bharat is that we want to leverage India's intrinsic strengths in order to be able to participate in global supply chains. So first of all, be absolutely clear that this is not about withdrawing behind some tariff wall. We, are, we want to participate in the rest of the world. We want to uh, export. We want to uh, encourage foreign direct investments to come here and manufacture here. So this is not some sort of a closing of the Indian market that many people may have tried to project. So what is it then? <clears throat> so let me give you an illustration so that this is clear. You all know that India has an extremely competitive pharmaceutical sector. However, through this entire COVID process, one of the things we discovered was that this highly competitive pharmaceutical sector is dependent on certain key inputs that come from single foreign sources, like for example, China. But in one particular case, um, for a vaccine, it was coming from uh, the US. Now, what we understood here was that it is quite possible that some shock hits the system, um, as has happened with chips um, for cars, for example, and the single source suddenly stops supplying you this one critical input. So it's obvious that we need to provide a certain amount of protection and support such that these key inputs are produced inside India. Now, if I provide support for producing that key input inside India, is it a case of the old style import substitution where we are hiding from the world? Or is it a case of simply being practical and pragmatic about providing for the resilience of a particularly globally competitive sector. I would argue that it is the latter. Now, how does this thinking correlate to the idea of complex systems of uncertainty? Well, it correlates very directly. If you are thinking about Atmanirbhar Bharat in terms of resilience, in terms of flexibility, then you can clearly see where we are going with this. If we live in this world of uncertainty, then it is very clear that the post-COVID world is not a re-inflation of the pre-COVID world. So we are going into a universe where all kinds of new things will happen. New technologies will come, new geopolitics will play a role, new supply chains will exist, consumer behavior will change, and all of these things will interact with each other in entirely unpredictable ways. So, how do you make a policy for this universe? Well, there are two, two big principles. One is resilience and the other is flexibility. And you can clearly see that all our policies are basically about this, making our factor markets more flexible and at the same time investing in resilience. I gave you one example of resilience with the example of the pharmaceutical sector. Well, you know what? We need to do that with other things as well. For example, you know, we have a huge automotive industry. Clearly, the recent shortages of chips has caused major disruptions. This should never happen again. How can we have this huge sector which is dependent on this one input that if it stops, this big sector just suddenly comes to a grinding halt? The point is a certain amount of resilience has to be there. Same thing is true for being able to flexibly deal with completely new things that may be emerging uh, and for that we need to remove restrictions and regulations that get in the way of innovation. So again look at the policies that we have been putting in place. We put in place a new drones policy and in that new drones policy we have removed all kinds of restrictions. Now of course when you completely make a new sector um, so free you know some things will occasionally uh, be disruptive and you know maybe at a future date we may have to yet again tighten them 
But for this period where there are new innovations happen, we have to open up the skies and allow for new things to happen, including things that may go wrong. So this is the thinking behind our new drone policy. It is one of the most open drone policies in the world. And hopefully, Indian drone startups will be able to get in there and be able to uh, participate in this completely new sector. Same thinking is there behind the opening up of the cartography and geospatial sector, which we did um, just a few months back in, I think it was in March, when we did this. And again, the thinking here is, rather than allow the continuation of a old monopoly of the survey of India, we have opened it up to new innovators who can come in there and take us to the next level in this very critical sector. Same thing is true of satellites where we have opened it up uh, to private players to participate in. So you can clearly see what we are doing. On one hand, we are investing in resilience because obviously an uncertain world requires resilience, but it also requires flexibility. And for that, we are opening all kinds of things up so that new innovations can happen continuously. Now, this is also the same kind of thinking that has gone into other policies. For example, the insolvency and bankruptcy code. The world of uncertainty that I have described clearly is a world of continuous churn, of creative destruction. Old sectors die, new sectors emerge. Old companies die, new sectors emerge. So if you want a vibrant economy, you want this to continuously churn. So if churn is what we are attempting, then obviously we have to allow for continuous process of insolvency and bankruptcy. There's nothing wrong in insolvency and bankruptcy. All kinds of risk taking mean that some of it will go wrong. Even if it succeeds for a period of time, after a period of time, it could go wrong. So we have to allow for this. This is why one of the most important innovations and reforms of this government has been insolvency and bankruptcy. And of course, from time to time, small companies and large companies will go bust. We should accommodate that and there should be no social stigma to entrepreneurs who go wrong because it just means that they tried something new and it didn't work. If anything, they should be encouraged to get out there and do it again. An important part of this government's emerging economic strategy is the emphasis on monetization and privatization. Now, why are these two strategies, which are linked obviously, uh, a part of an approach that sees the world in terms of continuous churn and uncertainty? Well, it's just quite obvious. If you have a large amount of assets, particularly those who are not being utilized or have become derelict because whatever was their original use has no longer any relevance, then it makes sense that we monetize these assets, especially if there is a chance that the private sector can take uh, it and make better use of it. Let me illustrate this point. In many cities across the country, there are large chunks of derelict land lying around because they belong to factories that are no longer functioning. Examples of this are in the middle of Kanpur, there are these old textile mills that have uh, chunks of land. Uh, all along the Hooghly River in Kolkata, you have old warehouses and jute mills that are no longer functioning. Uh, even in, in the middle of Delhi, uh, you have a large chunk of land uh, not far from uh, Purana Kila, where there is an old derelict uh, uh, thermal power plant and all along the Yamuna River. So why not take these um, assets and monetize them in various ways? Uh, after all, in a country where we are continuously expanding our cities, we are going up and gobbling up uh, new lands that are productive agricultural land in some cases, or even forest land uh, in some uh, instances, uh, when in fact there is all this useful uh, land that is lying around. So surely uh, it makes sense from the perspective of the government to not merely to monetize them in the sense of raising some revenue, which is of course useful and we can use that for other things, uh, but also because these assets can then be used to create one um, 
urban amenities uh, like parks and other things that can be used for the citizens and very often you can't get this kind of land in the middle of the city anymore but also for new offices uh, for new housing estates or even high-tech manufacturing uh, and so on so the idea here is that as circumstances change many of these assets which are not being utilized can now be utilized for new things again notice here the idea is directly derived from the thinking of continuous change and evolution which is central to the new economic philosophy now the same thinking is there behind privatization now it may have been the case that at some point in the past uh, the government through the public sector had to set up uh, you know enterprises to do activities that the private sector either was not willing to do or could not scale up. Um, we can debate whether it was a sensible idea back in the 1960s. But it is quite obvious in many cases that the, uh, these assets can be leveraged uh, much, much more efficiently by the private sector by bringing in new practices uh, which are uh, you know, more com derived from more market-based uh, incentives but also it frees up resources that the government can go out and do other things which may by the way even entail in some cases a new public sector uh, effort for example has happened with the new uh, DFI that we are setting up so it's not like uh, you know there is no space for the public sector there are areas and strategic areas where there is uh, where we intend to retain a significant uh, public uh, presence uh, and there may be areas where new public sector may also be have to be built but there are many, many areas of the existing public sector. For example, airlines, it could be hotels, it could be all kinds of other assets that clearly can be run much more efficiently by the private sector. They are far more capable of dealing with an uncertain world because they are far more able to deal with market signals and to be able to respond faster than a more bureaucratic system would be able to do. It's simply practical to be able to offload them take those resources and do other things with them. So again, you can clearly see this idea of a churning, uncertain um, world where uh, you know, we have to take decisions uh, which can deal with a much uh, more non-deterministic economic path, lead us to many of the policies that we are putting together. As I said, not every policy will always work, but the very nature of what we are doing means that we are not uh, committed to any one policy except to the extent that feedback allows us to continuously hone them. And hopefully through feedback we can continuously adjust along the way and take the country forward. It is a different way of uh, trying to make economic policy, but at least in our view, this is the only sensible way to deal with a very uncertain future. In the next episode of Economic Sutra, we are going to look at smart cities. This will be a way of illustrating uh, the new economic strategy that I just talked about. Um, it will also show you how a decentralized approach leads to very interesting urban outcomes, particularly in smaller cities. So see you on Sunset TV in the next episode. Namaskar.